the book of Ecclesiastes is quite different from all other books of the Bible. Somebody once wrote, I don't know why this book found its way into such an esteemed company. In most of the other books, God reveals himself as, the, as a merciful God who extends salvation to those that love and obey him. In the Gospels, Jesus is preaching the kingdom of God. But Ecclesiastes starts with vanity and it ends with death. A brother once called this book the groanings of an old man. So what can we learn from this book? And how can we find the kingdom in Ecclesiastes? I believe that it has been hidden in a critical verse by translators who perhaps didn't fully understand the purpose of this book. So how are we going to tackle this, um, this study then? We're going to have a look, and this is the topic, the kingdom in Ecclesiastes, for the online Bible school. And about eight points I'd like to look at. So first of all, we want to know what Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes means, the word I mean. Um, we're going to look at its place in the wisdom literature. We want to find out what is the meaning of vanity. And what works of Solomon does he refer to? And what are the things that are done under the sun that he's writing about? And in mid first can we find the kingdom? And then the conclusion of the matter. And then finally, how we can find the joy of the kingdom. So those are, that's the breakdown of, of, my, of that study. Now the books of the Bible are usually called after the first word. And the book of Ecclesiastes begins in Hebrew, the words of Kohelet. Kohelet is usually translated as teacher or preacher, but that is the way the book is called in Hebrew. And that word Kohelet comes from the word Kahal, which means a congregation. So a Kohelet is somebody who is an assembler, who calls out people to form an assembly, a congregation, a meeting or an ecclesia. And that's the purpose of this book, to form an ecclesia. So Ecclesiastes is not a bad translation, for an ecclesia is made up of people that are called out to form a congregation. God said to Jacob in Genesis 35 verse 11, a nation and a company, that's the word kahal, of which Kohelet comes, of nations shall be of thee. And Jesus, through the words of David on the cross, he said, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation of the Kahal, will I praise thee. So, in the first instance, the assembler, the Kohelet, is the son of David and king in Jerusalem. And that must be Solomon, of course. But for us, it is also God who is calling out the people to himself through Jesus Christ and promising them a place in his kingdom. And that's the purpose of this unusual book. For only those who realize the vanity of life will respond to that call. Now Solomon wrote several books that became part of the Bible, the Song of Songs and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And together with the books of Job and the book of Psalms, they make up what is often referred to as the wisdom literature. And may be interesting to contemplate at which stages of his life Solomon might have written the song, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. So the book, the first book, the Song of Songs, is essentially a divine love song, not to be mistaken for an exotic Eastern song. It was probably written by a young Solomon who was looking for a bride who is fit to be his wife, the queen for a king. The language therefore, although based on the natural, is symbolic. In this song the bride is singing to her beloved and the beloved responds to her with his songs. The second book of Solomon is the book of Proverbs. 
and I called it a manual for life. When Solomon became king, God appeared unto him in a dream, and Solomon asked God, Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people, for who can judge this thy people that is so great? And this godly wisdom and knowledge is distilled in the many parallels or proverbs in this book. And then we come to the third book of Solomon, which is the book of Ecclesiastes. And here is Solomon as an older man looking back on his life. Perhaps Ecclesiastes is best known for those verses in chapter 3, which Brother Richard read, uh, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven, which often read at funerals. I believe, however, that we can learn much from this book. It puts life into a fuller perspective. It gives us a philosophy for life. Famous American writer Thomas Wolfe once said, Ecclesiastes is the greatest single piece of writing I've ever known, and the wisdom expressed in it the most lasting and profound. Now the word vanity, that's how the book starts, vanity of vanity, what does it actually mean? Sometimes translated as vapor or breath, insubstantial or vain or futile. That's what Solomon says right at the beginning, vanity of vanities, says the Kohelet, the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Vanity. What profit has a man of all his labor which he takes under the sun? One generation passes away, and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Out of a total of 86 occurrences of this word in the Bible, you find 36 of them in the book of Ecclesiastes. So what is actually the vanity the Bible is speaking of in this book? I believe that the concept of vanity is first expressed and described in Genesis chapter 4. Because vanity in Hebrew is Hevel, and it's the same as the name of Abel, the second son of Adam and Eve. We don't say Abel in Hebrew, you call him Hevel. So we say vanity or vanity, we may as well say Abel of Abel's. So we read in Genesis 4, verse 1 and 2, that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man, Yahweh. The word from is in italics, and we shouldn't read that, because Eve knew very well that she got, although we acknowledge that everything comes from God, she knew, she knew that, of course, she got uh, Cain from Adam, and she called him Yahweh. And then again she bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Why should anybody call the second son, as Eve did, vanity? I believe that Cain had hoped, that Eve had hoped, that Cain was going to be Yahweh, that promised seed that was to overcome the seed of the serpent. Eve had all her hopes pinned on him so that he may undo the damage that she had done by listening to the serpent. She knew that it was primarily her fault that she and Adam were banished from the Garden of Eden. But when she observed Cain's character when he was a little older, she must have realized that Cain could never be that seed of the woman, because she had the character of the seed of the serpent. And therefore, she called his younger brother vanity, Abel. She must have recognized the vanity of life, because she realized that the promised Yahweh was not going to be revealed in her lifetime. Therefore, she must have called the second son Hevel, vanity. Life must have appeared very bleak and vain to her. It's heartbreaking, brothers and sisters, to read this if you understand the meaning of the names. All her hopes 
of returning to the Garden of Eden in her lifetime were dashed. And that is where the vanity of vanities began. Now if we turn to chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes, then we read from verse 4 to 8. And there the assembler expresses this vanity in the cycle of life. It starts there by saying, one generation passes away and another generation comes. But the earth abides forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastes to his place where he arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns about unto the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. All things are full of labor. Men cannot express it. The eyes are not satisfied with seeing, though the ear filled with hearing. And that verse 4 was famously used by the American President Abraham Lincoln in his address on the, to the reconvening Congress on December the 1st in 1862 during the darkest hour of the uh, civil war in America. He said, one generation passes away, that's our verse 4, and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. And he says, our strife, as to, of course the American civil war, pertains to ourselves to the passing generations of men. And it can without convulsion be hushed forever with the passing of one generation. This generation hardly remembers the American Civil War. You may learn about it in school, but for him it was reality, but only for that one generation. So the endless cycle of life is the ultimately vanity of life. And then Solomon asks, what profit as a man of all his labor, which he takes under the sun. Now the word prophet in Hebrew just have the same sense as what we think is prophet. It's the word eton. And we use it in, when we lived in Jerusalem almost every day when we went to the banks. That is, what is the eton in our bank? What is the bank balance? You put in your income and, uh, and out of it comes your, your rent and the bills you pay and uh, the food you have to buy, the clothes for your children. And the word profit, Eton, is what is left over. And so we need to ask ourselves what at the end of our lives is left over, the profit, the, what is left over from our hard labor under the sun. Of course, Solomon carried out major building activities in Jerusalem. We see the evidence of these throughout the city, including what is known as the King's Garden. Let's have a look at these activities. But Solomon at the end said, I looked on the first chapter 2 and verse 11. I looked on all the works that my hands had brought and on the labor that I had labored to do and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. There is no profit, nothing left of all he did under the sun. And so here we see um, the city of David in this, in this drawing down below. And Mount Moriah was still uh, an empty place in the time of David. But Solomon made the city twice as big. He extended it far to the north. He built a temple and his palace, the house of the forest of Lebanon, and many, many more houses. He extended the city wall uh, north of the city of David. And here you can actually see the wall that was built by King Solomon, which has been excavated in Jerusalem. So we know that he did an awful lot of works. Not only nothing much is left of it, we also know that he uh, built a temple, the first temple on Mount Moriah, with the altar in front and the laver, you get the two pillars of the porch, the Yachin and the Boaz and then the Holy, and at the back, we have the Holy of Holies, with the Ark of the Covenant, beneath us two carabine in the Holy of Holies. And it must have been a very imposing uh, building indeed. 
And all of us have done things in our lives that we think are important. Maybe we have contributed something important in our work that we can be proud of. Perhaps we feel proud of the family we have raised. But do they always continue in the truth? Only time will tell. Some people have done great things for humanity by making their lives better. While others are making war for what they consider to be a righteous cause. But what is left over of all that at the end of our lives? What is left over from all our work under the sun? And that phrase, under the sun, is mentioned 29 times in this book. So it must be an important thing to understand what he means by what is done under the sun. And I can only think, or well, the first thing that came up in my mind is that woman described in Luke chapter 13 and verse 11. I'll hear first of all is the, the Garden of Solomon. That's, he also planted the garden. But here's that woman. There was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed down together and could in no wise lift up herself. And here you see a picture of a woman like that. And Jesus healed her. And he said to the Pharisees, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on this Sabbath day? She had probably labored in the field and got arthritis. But despite her condition, she still went to the synagogue or to the meeting, as we would say. This woman was a daughter of Abraham, says Jesus. And therefore, she must have believed in the promises that God made to Abraham. And after Jesus healed her, she was made straight and glorified God. The more we look down on what happens with our lives under the sun, the more we get depressed and bow down as this woman was. We are all a little bit like this woman because we are all concerned with what is happening below us or under the sun. But we need to go to the scriptures to lift ourselves up and to look to things above the sun, to the heaven where God dwells. We need to be healed by the words of Jesus in the Gospels so that we also can be made straight and glorify God. It will never happen if we keep looking at all the things that happen under the sun. So what can we do then in this life? Are there two wonderful verses in the Psalms that we found very helpful? It says in Psalm 25 and verse 1, Unto thee, Yahweh, do I lift up my soul. If we lift up our soul unto God, then his healing powers are extended to us too, because in another Psalm, 146 and verse 7, it says, Yahweh raises them that are bowed down. So the things above the sun, or the things of God in heaven, are more important than any work that is done on earth, including our own. So in which first then, as I said in the beginning, in, of Ecclesiastes, can we find a kingdom? We need to go to the chapter 3, which Brother Richard read, read for us, and at verse 11. There's the critical verse, I believe, in this whole book. Once we understand what the original meaning of this verse is, then I think we understand the kingdom in the book of Ecclesiastes. It says in the King James, he has made everything beautiful in his time. Also you said the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God makes from beginning to the end. But the new King James says, of course, he said the eternity in their heart. But even so, man can't find out the work that God makes from the end. And reading this, it doesn't make any sense to me. And I believe this verse hasn't been translated properly. God doesn't put the world in our hearts. If the world is in our heart, then we've done it ourselves. We can't blame anybody else. 
so as the New King James says, eternity is already a little bit better. But what's the real word used in Hebrew for a world or eternity? It is the Olam. Because, let me see, here it says, he has made everything beautiful in his time. Also he said the Olam in their heart. So that no man can find out the word that God makes from beginning to the end. And those of you who have read the words of John Thomas, for example, know that the Olam is the hidden age. It comes from Alam, is to hide. It's a period of time which has not yet been revealed. Now what is the Olam then? Well, it's a time hidden or concealed from men. Look at this verse in Exodus chapter 31, verses 16 and 17, where God instructs Moses, Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, that is, for the Olam. When you read forever, it's not always endless till all eternity. There's a specific time period. God's mercy is for the Olam. For in six days, Yahweh made the heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. When you read for his mercy is forever, it actually means his mercy is for the Olam. It's the hidden age of the kingdom, when God will rest, and Jesus with his saints will rule. That's why on the seventh day, on the Sabbath day, Jesus healed that woman that was bowed down. So God's mercy is for the Olam. He's working with his angels now to set up that kingdom and populate it with men and women who have conformed themselves to the image of Christ, to have prepared themselves to become helper, kings and priests to Jesus. They belong to the Kahal that were called out by Kohelet, the assembly, or the preacher. I believe the true meaning of this verse in Hebrew is this. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Because whatever God does is good and exactly according to his plan. Also he said, the olam in their heart. It's not so that we can't find out. No, without which, says in the Hebrew, we bli asher. Without which, without the Olam, no man can find out the work that God makes from beginning to the end. And that is a wonderful thing, brethren and sisters. Once we've got the kingdom in our heart, then we can find out the work that God makes from beginning to the end, at least as much as he has revealed unto us. Gone. Uh, let's go back to the chapter 3. Uh, of Ecclesiastes and verse 14. And there we read, whatsoever God does, it shall be for the Olam, it's for the kingdom, to bring the kingdom near. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God does it, that men should fear before him. So we may not always understand why things happen in our lives under the sun, why we have to suffer at times, but we know that if we dedicate our lives to God, then whatsoever he does is to bring us nearer to the kingdom. And if we believe in God, then we are of the kingdom. We are of the Olam. <clears throat> in Isaiah 63, and verse 19, it says, again in the Hebrew, we are of the Olam. Thou didst not rule over them, over the advers adversaries. They are not called by thy name. <clears throat> So if you find things difficult to cope with, we must try, as one brother once said, to look at life through Olam, or kingdom, tinted spectacles. Look at things above the sun, not what happens on this earth under the sun. It is looking forward to the kingdom, brethren and sisters. If you have that in our heart, that provides us with a philosophy to live our lives by in every circumstance we find ourselves in. So what can we do then in this life? It's by reading God's word, we can develop his character in ourselves through the life of Jesus Christ. 
we can also try and help others by letting our light shine. Let's go towards the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. Look what it says in chapter 11. Here is it Solomon's advice to, uh, to the older people. He says, cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. We must be able to teach the gospel message of salvation to others. If that kingdom is in our hearts, brothers and sisters, then we can't help but speak about it. What does Solomon say to the younger generation? Chapter 12. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. So young people, we must make sure that we read, not only read, but meditate on the Bible daily. Talk about God's word with each other. Because only the Bible contains those upright words of truth. So in, if you are still in chapter 12, and look at those verses 10 and 11. And if you can, I would always leave out the italics. Because then you read that a preacher sought out to find out acceptable words, written, upright words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given of one shepherd. And these words are in the scriptures. They can also be spoken by brethren and sisters. We can all become Kohelets, preachers, assemblers, if you look after the Ecclesia and strengthen things that remain. Now the words of the wise are as goats and as nails. What, what does that mean? I think we should look at exactly what that one shepherd said to Saul when he asked, Jesus, on the road to Damascus, he said, Who art thou, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. But what are those pricks or those goats? Well, the picture is here men plowing. There are four mules, I guess. And they've got a crossbar behind them. But when they start their work, they often kick backwards. They can hurt the farmer or destroy the equipment and they're from the side of the animals of that crossbar they put in uh, nails or sharp pieces of metal or, or flint so that the animal kicks backwards, it hurts itself and won't do it again. And that is what, uh, what Saul was doing all the time. He was kicking against the pricks. Oh, which words was he kicking against? If they were not the words of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. We won't go there now, but this chapter is not just a potted history of Israel. Stephen in this chapter focuses on the examples of two people, of Joseph and of Moses. Both were first rejected as rulers by their brethren, but God sent them back the second time to live a the Israelites from the house of bondage. And Jesus also was rejected by his brethren, as Stephen explains, when he first came to earth. But we now are expecting him to come back for the second time to establish God's kingdom, the kingdom of the Olam on the earth. Saul knew deep in his heart that Stephen had spoken acceptable words, written, upright words of truth. And they were weighing on his conscience. He was kicking against them, although he knew that they were true words. So let us then, brethren and sisters, obey God's words and not kick against it. Let us, let us lift up our eyes to things above the sun and not become depressed by things that happen under the sun. While we are alive, we must use every opportunity to let Christ dwell in, our, in us richly and not get depressed by the present social distancing and lockdown, for example. 
Today it was reported in the news that the number of people in the UK suffering from depression has doubled since the beginning of this pandemic. But let this country count our blessings that we have with our present online Bible school. That we've got so many things to be thankful for. As Christadelphians, we often wonder if Solomon will be in the kingdom. But whatever you have in mind, remember that we are not judges. But as Solomon reflected on his life, when he knew that his death was approaching, and as described in that last chapter, he drew the right conclusion. What was the conclusion? of the matter. There we have it in chapter 12, in verses 13 and 14. Let us see the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of men. Duty is not there, brothers and sisters, for that is all of men. All God wants us to be is to fear him and to keep his commandments knowing that he will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it is good or evil. That was good advice for Solomon himself and for us too. Perhaps it may indicate that Solomon repented at the end of his life. Because earlier in chapter 7 and verse 8, Solomon had said, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. And an, en an eminent, eminent example of this is Job, of course. Job was the patient man who suffered much, more than any of us have ever suffered. But God knew that he feared him, that he kept his commandments, and that he would never betray his maker. And indeed, Job's end was better than his beginning. Because in the last chapter of the book of Job, we read that Yahweh restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, Yahweh gave Job twice as much as he had before. And so Yahweh blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. So, as Solomon said, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And James says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So God can be merciful to us, to all of us who repent, including Solomon. But of course, God is the judge and not us. So let us hope, brothers and sisters, that even if we have to suffer because of what happens to us in our lives under the sun, that our end may be like that. And pray that together with Solomon, we may be able to stand before Christ in the judgment day and receive that double blessing that Job was promised, namely the joy of the kingdom. What was that double blessing that he got? Well, in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 7, God says, and this applies to Job and to all of us, instead of your shame, you shall have double. That's what God gave to Job in the end of the Lord. He is very merciful. He gave him twice as much. He gave him double. What does it mean? Instead of confusion, and Job was very confused, and so are we at times, they shall rejoice in their portion, therefore in their land. And the land has been promised to us also in the kingdom. They shall possess the double. What does it mean, double? Everlasting joy shall be theirs. Or, as it says in the Hebrew, the joy of the Olam. That was the key to the kingdom in verse chapter 3 and verse 11. That is the joy of the kingdom that is set before us too. So I hope that we can all share this joy of the kingdom now so that we may be with Christ at his return.